Welcome everyone. Um, for those who maybe don't know me, I'm Jason Warren. I'm one of the uh, neurologists working at the uh, National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery in the Cognitive Clinic, and uh, also the neurologist who runs the PPA um, research program at uh, the Dementia Research Centre at UCL. And it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to what is um, becoming the, the status quo. Um, just to say, we are very hopeful we'll have a face-to-face -face meeting later in the year, and that we're very excited to get everyone back face-to-face. -face. I think that will be very nice, but hopefully these uh, webinars are useful, and we've had a, several of them now, so um, very interested in your feedback as well, all of you. And a particular welcome to new people who may be joining us new, and um, hopefully get, get your chance to ease into things a bit, ask some questions, and begin to feel hopefully that you're part of a a wider community of people living with PPA and other interested parties across the whole country, really, and even beyond. So as usual, there's some housekeeping things just to run through with respect to the, the webinar. Um, for start, um, all questions, so the, for the Q&A, this is for the afternoon, uh, for the um, last session this morning, all questions must go to the Q&A box. Um, and you can submit questions anonymously if you tick this little um, box to tick for that, um, if you want to. Um, the chat box is, is disabled, so don't, don't try to use that um, for, for the webinars. Um, this webinar is being recorded, um, and the main reason for mentioning that actually is because if you miss anything, um, you know, okay, you have to go away or you want a cup of tea or something, um, you can always catch up with it after. There's a, an RDS, Rare Dementia Support YouTube uh, channel that comes on live about a week after the live session today. And uh, you'll be getting a link emailed to you um, once that's uh, live, once that's available. Um, and then if we mention things that are useful, we may mention some resources um, on the way through in the talks or in the Q&A, um, then um, we'll share that in a follow-up. Uh, email as well. So just the main message is don't don't worry if you miss anything. There'll be plenty of scope to pick things up. And we've got a, a nice agenda today. So um, we we usually try to have a theme uh, for our meetings, and uh, we thought that it would be very pertinent to look at um, aspects of pain and uh, sort of sensitivity to stimulation uh, more generally, which can be big issues with with PPA. Um, and so what we would the sort of agenda today is what we're kicking off with um, shortly is um, uh, a talk on um, total pain, so the various dimensions of pain in PPA by Ali Rose uh, Sisk, uh, who's a, a PhD student, also a clinical uh, nurse um, with a particular interest uh, in symptom management um, in frontotemporal dementias, including PPA. So very interested to hear her talk a little bit about her perspectives on that from her research. And then at about 10.20, um, we go to um, a talk by Dr. Ida Suez gonzalez um, who is uh, an expert psychologist, neuropsychologist, talking about behavioural and psychological symptoms uh, in people with PPA, with some helpful tips um, to help people respond to those and cope with those positively. And then uh, shortly after half past, about 10.35, we move to uh, our, one of our regular fixtures, which is in conversation uh, with an RDS uh, member with particular experience uh, of, of, of living with pain. Um, and very, very pleased to welcome um, Jackie Hazan and Olivia Wood um, uh, to, to run that session. And then um, finally, at about 10.50, we kick off with um, a QA. and a And then Anna Falkmer, who probably needs no introduction, but for new people is our expert speech and language therapist um, who has a particular clinical and academic interest in PPA. Uh, we'll chair that um, and the, uh, the talkers uh, and, and I will participate in that as well. And we've, the whole thing we hope will wind up at about 11.30. So I think without further ado, I will clear the floor now for Ali Rose um, talking about total pain and PPA perspectives from her research. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Hello, everyone. My name is Ali Rose. I'm just going to share my screen. 
Thank you, Jason, for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here and to be speaking a bit about my PhD and how total pain and PPA ties in with that. I, as Jason mentioned, I'm a, a staff nurse. I'm up north in, in West Hertz and I'm a full time PhD student and I have a, a passion for dementia care, in particular the young onset uh, frontotemporal dementias. So I'm really excited to speak a bit more about that. My supervisors include Professor uh, Liz Sampson, um, Professor Jason Warren, who's kindly invited me to be here today, and Dr. Charla Kenton and Dr. Norea Cupelli, who are both based at our Marie Curie Palliative Care Research Department at UCL. So this is a screen grab of some of our team, our colleagues, our friends. We are a very smiley, approachable brunch, I would think, and we are really, really passionate and ambitious about driving palliative dementia care. And what I mean by palliative care is an approach that improves the quality of life of patients and their families facing the problems associated with life threatening illnesses. And we do this through the prevention and relief of suffering by early identification and assessment of treatment of pain and other problems, uh, be it physical, psychological, social or spiritual issues. So we are really, really passionate about driving uh, palliative care. And I just want to talk a small bit around this. Um, it's interesting when I speak to people about my work and I've often been met with, you know, oh, Marie Curie are doing lots in dementia care now. That's fantastic. Um, it used to be very focused on, um, you know, cancer care. And absolutely that's true. Um, but the model of palliative care has moved very much so from that traditional um, cancer focused um, care model. And now we've identified that actually many symptoms that people experience with, with cancer or diabetes or COPD or any other life threatening illness are actually shared by people with dementia or young onset dementia or frontotemporal dementias or PPAs. Um, so we've identified that actually palliative care is imperative in treating symptoms and catching them at the very, very early stages in order to, to live better. So we're really, really passionate about this type of care delivery. So this leads me on to my, the P, my PhD and the aim of my PhD, which is to explore the palliative care needs of people with frontotemporal dementias in terms of total pain. So I spoke a bit about palliative care and although we can see the benefits of palliative care and it's recommended to everyone that has a diagnosis of dementia, but people with dementia are actually less likely to receive palliative care. So we're all about driving that change. Um, and although we know that people with dementia may benefit from palliative care, the palliative care needs of people with young onset dementia, in particular the frontotemporal type, such as PPA, there's actually very little known about what the needs are. So that's why, you know, my PhD aims to explore that. Now I mentioned total pain and what exactly is that? Uh, total pain is a, a palliative care concept and it, it's a really, really nice way of putting, I think, person-centered care and looking at the person as a whole. Um, gone are the days, thankfully, of just treating nociceptive pain or physical pain. And actually, I find as a nurse, sometimes it's quite easy to treat physical pain um, as opposed to different types of pain, such as social, spiritual or psychological. And when we look at this, I suppose, this diagram of pain, we can see that physical pain is not completely separate to spiritual, nor is psychological to social these different aspects of pain more often than not uh, play a part on each other. So for example, if you have an early uh, diagnosis of PPA and it's affecting your communication and you feel, you know, that psychologically um, your, you know, what's bothering you is your communication um, issues that might have a social effect on you. And actually your sense of spirituality or your sense of self may in fact, um, you know, be impacted additionally on that. So it's multidimensional and it's not one thing, it's whatever you deem it to be. So it's a really, really nice way of exploring um, the palette of care needs. So a bit more specific, uh, total pain and PPA. So well, what do we know about PPA? We know PPA can bring about language difficulties. It can bring about speech problems, perhaps reduced comprehension or difficulty recognizing 
people or objects or calling words of objects that we, we would have always known. And in the early stages, we can have these symptoms and actually our memory, our judgment can remain perfect. So there's an awareness of these, these issues, which can be very, very difficult for someone who's been diagnosed with PPA. And there, this absolutely has to tie in with total pain in some way. Um, when people you know, come to terms with a diagnosis, when they experience um, changes in their social life, their family life, you know, physical changes, um, perhaps changes in who they feel they are spiritually or whatever spirituality means to you. So despite the limited literature in this area, we really do believe that a diagnosis of PPA must of course have an impact of your total pain experience. So I mentioned that there is little known in the literature around the palliative care needs of people with PPA. And this is not just specific to PPA. Um, there is a lack of literature around the whole frontotemporal dementias at uh, the area of frontotemporal dementia and palliative dementia care in itself. But as I mentioned, for my PhD, we're really focusing in on this to make sure the voice of people with PPA is heard and other frontotemporal dementias. So, when I looked at the literature to understand a bit more about this, we found an array of different symptom categories um, that people with frontotemporal dementias, including PPA, experience. So there was issues um, around elimination, hygiene, activities of daily living, uh, motor disturbance. We also had pain, but just physical, just to note. There was issues named around um, symptoms for, for eating and swallowing or sleep disturbance. So I won't list all of these out, but there was a huge array of symptoms um, within the literature. And most of this um, literature explored physical and psychological type symptoms. And while there were some social symptoms explored, such as social isolation, um, there was a lack of it and there was very little spiritual type symptoms or needs explored. So what does this tell, this tell us? Well, I suppose this leaves us with the question, um, are physical and psychological needs more important for people with PPA? Or, you know, is, is there less of an emphasis on social and spiritual needs? Or as, is this area just absolutely uncovered, which, which we really feel it is? So it brings us back to our question, well, what are the total pain needs of people with PPA and other frontotemporal dementias? Well, we want, us, we want you to tell us, you are the experts. You are the people living with PPA. You are caring for people with PPA. And we want to hear from you. What are these needs? How do you feel? What pain do you experience? Do you experience any? And for this reason, I've launched a cohort study for my PhD to find out just that and to speak with you, the experts. And I have a screen grab of my, my study advertisement on the right. Now the text is very small. I'm just um, showing it for visual purposes and very happy to circulate this amongst anyone interested in, in talking to me about this type work. But I have launched a cohort study and I am looking for people with moderate to severe stages of PPA. I'll be looking to catch you for a one hour survey and this will happen on three occasions over the space of six months. So. Again, I, I understand everyone is very busy, um, but it would be fantastic if we could have some more people on board, particularly with PPA, as we actually have quite a heavy um, saturated sample of people with the behavioral type variant of frontotemporal dementia. So it would be fantastic to have people on board with PPA to really explore what the total pain needs are for you and how you experience them. And this one hour survey, so far we've 18 participants um, who, are, uh, who are actually finishing their second uh, survey at this point, although we're still recruiting. And everyone so far has found it, you know, an hour to reflect on where they're at, an hour to get some advice, an hour to just talk through their journey, their story and have their voice heard. So I really do hope that you will help me on my journey to explore what the total pain needs are for you. And I know we're going to do some discussion after the presentation, so I'm happy to answer any questions uh, specific to my nursing clinical work or the research around um, the symptoms of total pain, be it physical, psychological, social or spiritual. 
So thank you so much uh, for listening. I hope it was somewhat helpful and lovely to meet you all. My email is here if you would like to reach out and just get some more information about the study. And I'm happy to link in with anyone and chat some more about this work. So thank you. Thanks very much, Shelley Rose. Um, very, very helpful and, and actually breaking new ground there. I just wanted to say, um, because palliative care, um, like dementia itself, in fact, ha has a lot of bad press and a lot of uh, sort of um, misconceptions about it. And uh, one of the major misconceptions is it tends to be linked to cancer and it tends to be linked to sort of end of life. And it's, it's neither of those, it's much broader than that. And really people who uh, palliative care physicians and palliative care specialists have a particular expertise in the management of symptoms. And this is a very, very major issue, of course, with all of our diseases and the PPAs included in that, where we don't at the moment, unfortunately, have disease modifying therapies. A lot of our treatments are really around the optimization of quality of life and the management of symptoms. And I think we're only just scratching the surface with the kind of um, awareness of pain issues in PPA. So definitely keen to hear from you about that. So our next um, speaker is uh, Ida um, um, Torres Gonzalez, who I, th I think, hopefully, well, may, may not need um, much uh, introduction, um, but she's talking more from a clinical psychological perspective about um, uh, kind of the management of, of behavioral and psychological symptoms, which can certainly cause a lot of distress. Uh, in PPA uh, and ways to cope with them. So I will hand over to Ida without further ado. Ida. Thank you very much, Jay Chung. I'm going to share my screen. So good morning, everyone. And yes, I'm, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist. I do research and, and clinical practice, and I specialized in using neuropsychological models and approaches to treat people with non-memory-led dementias and, and PPA among them. So what I will do over the next few minutes is actually to introduce you to a set of simple strategies to manage apathy and depression if you live with PPA or if you are supporting someone living with PPA. This talk is about the, the behavioral and psychological symptoms, and I decided to focus on these two because they are the most prevalent and they impact a lot on the quality of life of living, living with PPA. Um, but, but there are things that we can do to manage them better. So, apathy uh, first. So to understand how to manage apathy, it is very important to have a basic understanding of how apathy works. And from a clinical point of view, Apathy is a loss of motivation in comparison with how the person used to be. So for instance, the person no longer starts conversations or doesn't participate in social activities, has lost interest in, in things related with the family and family affairs, little emotional reactions to, to significant events. This, this cluster of, of symptoms that we can observe this is apathy, and in order to be clinical apathy, like something that clinicians can diagnose, like, like having a proper apathy, this needs to be present most of the time. So it cannot be only every now and then. So it's this cluster of symptoms present most of the time. That is what we understand by apathy. And apathy is the most prevalent neuropsychiatric symptom in PPA, or one of the most prevalent. Around 60% of people with primary progressive aphasia experience apathy. And this has a big impact on quality of life. We, we know that the neural mechanisms which give rise, rise to apathy have to do with the affectation of areas in the brain, in particular in cortical, oh, sorry, in particular in cortical structures in the front of the brain but also in deeper structures under those cortices and the connections between them. So what I'm trying to say here is that um, 
apathy is a symptom. It is not on purpose. It is not that the person is not trying hard enough. It is something that is out of control. I mean, the person doesn't have control on this. It is a symptom of the disease. And when apathy is present, people usually struggle at three levels. One is um, initiating the action, starting the action. So something that family says is, um, I need to push him to get into the shower. I need to push him to prepare breakfast. It's this need from prompts that um, is very characteristic of this difficulty initiating action. The other level of difficulty is my maintaining the action once initiated. So family says, oh, I need, you know, um, he starts preparing breakfast and he gets stuff stuck halfway there or he starts removing the weeds in the garden and he stops and he stares into the space. So this indicates a difficulty maintaining the action. And the third is the emotional planting. So people explain this themselves as feeling numb or not feeling emotions strong enough or not caring much about the things. So this is something that people can observe from the outside, but also people experiencing this, this type of apathy, this difficulty at this emotional level, they can express how they feel themselves. And, and it is this pretty much, they always refer to this thing of feeling numb or feeling the emotions, like if they were turned down. And for each one of these three levels of difficulty, we have a different strategy. So I want to show you now um, and learn together more about the strategy to manage lack of initiation. And we are gonna do that with a practical example. So I'm gonna introduce you Tom. Tom is this man here. And Tom lives with primary progressive aphasia and he has apathy and he spends all day in front of the TV. And his wife, Mary, tries to convince him to engage in activities. She's trying to help. She's trying to unlock this issue, this lack of activities, this lack of initiation. And this is how she does it. So she asks him what he wants to do. And she even makes specific suggestions. But this doesn't work because Tom's problem is not only for generating ideas and plans, which it is. He has problems to generate um, and difficulties to generate ideas and plans. But his main problem is for initiating the action. So Mary needs to change the strategy here because if the problem is with initiating action, we have to initiate if we want to support the person. And we do it this way, actually, um, starting the action. So Mary now takes the Tom's coat and, and, and he, he comes closer to him and, and she says, let's go for a walk. Here you have your coat. And she's initiating action and Tom just needs to follow up. But when the problem is maintaining the activity, the strategy is different. So... Tom is in the garden transplanting plants from pot to ground, and he plants one, and he stops. And he's left staring at the garden. And he takes seat in a chair and doesn't continue. And Mary comes in to sing again, trying to help. And she says to Tom, oh, why did you stop? Come on, carry on, trying to encourage him to continue. And, and Tom does nothing because he has an issue with maintaining the activity. He doesn't know how to continue. So he cannot link up the sequence of steps to continue. So Mary needs to tell him or show him how to carry on, like a prompt to carry on, give him some indication that he can use. So now you need to take the next plant from the pot and put it to ground. And this is something helpful, something helpful that that Tom can use to carry on with his activity. So I would like you to remember these two bits, um, this, this 
different these two strategies, these different ways to act on different levels of apathy, the problem for, for initiation and the problem for doing to maintain the action once initiated. And the strategy that we use to deal with indifference um, is also, there are things that we can do that are also um, useful to deal with depression because there is a link between apathy and depression. And there is also an element of apathy when people are depressed. So I will move now to this other section um, and we'll explain it all together. So as I said, depression and apathy are related, but they are definitely not the same thing. Um, they are uh, different problems and different uh, syndromes, but depressed people may also have shown apathy as part of the um, depressive clinical picture. I want to emphasize the clinical depression not the same as being bad. Being depressed is a continuous state of sadness, low self-esteem, feeling tearful, hopeless, losing the capacity to experience enjoyment and pleasure, and lack of energy. It is a whole cluster of symptoms that persist over time. Depression is a medical condition. It is serious and requires treatment. So it's not only feeling sad, feeling down, having low mood, a few days per month. It is this continuous state and requires treatment. And depressive symptoms are the second most common um, neuropsychiatric symptom in PPA after apathy. Um, around 50% of people with PPA experience these symptoms. Some studies say that 30% others that almost 80%, um, but, but um, probably um, um, an, an estimate an an accurate estimate made is lacking, but I think that with certain uh, level of uh, certainty, we can say that around fifty percent of people with PPA probably are going through these symptoms. And in the present symptoms um, really sometimes may have to do with the brain changes uh, brought about by the disease, but it can also be it can also be a reaction to challenges of living with primary progressive aphasia. Because the experience of losing your voice, losing your language, losing, losing your, your, your capacity to communicate and connect with the environment verbally can be very alienating, can be a very alienating experience. And going through this difficult process can really also make you depressed. And these are some quotes from people with PPA I've met. And I think that they reflect well the stigma and the exclusion and the feelings of isolation that come from living with the communication difficulties. So there is one particular strategy that I like a lot and I use a lot in clinic because of its simplicity and because of its effectiveness and that I would like to share with you because everybody can do it at home. So this is about having a piece of paper and write a list of activities that you enjoy. Small and easy activities that do not need much preparation. So for instance, it can be something like having an ice cream or go for a walk to the park or buy a pair of nice shoes if you like shoes or organizing coffee with friends or have a glass of wine in a terrace, sing a song, something like that. And if you have PPA, perhaps you can get some help from a relative or a friend to write this list. And if you are a supporter or a relative or a friend, uh, make sure that you involve the person with PPA when writing this list. And the next thing that you have to do with that, that list is schedule those activities. Super, super important. Put them all down in a calendar with a specific date and time, because if not, you won't do it. There are far higher rates of success using this strategy when people actually bother to write everything down in a calendar. And this very simple strategy is part, is, is, is part of an approach called actually a behavioral activation 
that it is evidence-based. It is based on models of human behavior that stimulate that exposing ourselves to experiences that make us feel good have an impact on our mood because it increases the opportunities to feel happy instead of feeling sad. But also influences our behavior because when, when something makes us feel good, we want to do more of it. And we psychologists call that positive reinforcement. I want to clarify here that if the person is clinically depressed, it still needs to be assessed and treated by a professional. So this, this strategy doesn't play magic, but it is useful to know and, and useful to, to use it. So to recap, um, this is your takeaway toolkit from today. These are the three things that I would like you to remember. So remember to initiate action. Remember to provide cues and prompts to continue the activity. And very important, remember to, to have fun and create opportunities for you to enjoy life and have fun. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Ada. Uh, yes, it, the, the message about having fun is very important and actually um, may come up in the Q&A or, or, or separately, but music is sometimes a good way to facilitate some of these uh, contacts. And um, from a research perspective, we really understand very little about the kind of actual real world communication that has to go on when um, people are actually communicating with one another in real life and what happens in PPA. But I'm interested. Was interested to see recently. So the Sydney group, uh, Miran Irish and Rebecca Ahmed's group, with whom we have a, a friendly rivalry <laughs> uh, in the research world, um, have just published a study actually trying to grapple with the kind of um, social interactions that, that that kind of are necessary and how people communicate at that level in PPA. So some there is some very interesting work now starting to come out, um, which hopefully will get more of a handle on understanding. Um, why these problems develop and how we can hopefully help them. So um, we now come to what is really the heart of the meeting, uh, which is um, where we um, see an interview of an RDS member. And the member today um, that agreed very kindly to take part is Jackie Hassan, um, and she's talking with um, Libby Wood. So I think without further ado, um, we'll, we'll just uh, let you hear that. They speak for themselves. Good morning, PPA support group. Um, it's Libby here from the direct support team. And I have the absolute privilege of being joined today by the lovely Jackie, who is a carer for her husband who lives with PPA. And today's conversation is going to focus mainly on ideas of pain and in particular headaches. And I know this Jackie is something that you have experience with as a carer. So let's get straight into our questions today. My okay. first question for you is, how has headaches affected your husband Zion's life? Well, just to give you a brief background, it started about a year ago, October 2020. Um, in fact, that's when he actually got quite a lot worse than he had been prior for two years. And it affected him in that he felt slightly dizzy, he wanted to lie down, he wanted to close his eyes, and it certainly slowed down a lot of his previous behaviour. Okay. And I know with PPA, um, one of the challenges with people living with PPA is communication. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how Zion communicates the pain he's experiencing from headaches? He would normally put his hand over his eyes like this and tell me he was feeling heavy headed and um, slightly dizzy and he'd want to go and lie down. Or he'd close his eyes and he'd lie down and perhaps he'd go to sleep. So basically, and it would be quite an inactive day mm -hmm. or morning. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So quite an inactive day, quite an inactive morning, as you were saying. And I can imagine that this might have had an impact on um, Zion's relationships with family and friends. Could you yeah. tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah, because obviously these things were unpredictable. It didn't happen at a certain time. Um, you know, it was quite unpredictable. So if you would feel 
um, uncomfortable, then he wouldn't really want to speak to people, understandably, and he'd just want to go in a quiet room, turn the television off, close his eyes or lie down. And he certainly wouldn't want to read the pay newspaper or anything like that. So it did affect him quite a lot. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what about your relationship with your husband because of the headaches? Do you feel that, because you, you're saying that he spends a lot more time um, but engaging in activities less, so um, not wanting to read the paper, not wanting to be around um, people. Is, has that affected your relationship at all? Yes, definitely so. But what we decided um, last year was to try and follow it up and see if we knew why this was happening, because it wasn't always severe pain. It was the whole head area feeling dizzy and uncomfortable. And so what we did, we went um, to an ear, nose and throat specialist and he did lots and lots of different tests and um, sent us to someone else. And however, it appeared that there was no particular reason for it. It could have been labyrinthitis that he'd had earlier, um, but that had gone. So we were left with still lots of questions as to why it was happening and how to resolve it. Certain methods were tried, but again, it was ascertained that he, he didn't have these particular problems. So we were left with a huge question mark. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So prior to that, um, before we went to the ENT specialist, we did come up to the National and we saw one of the team and he um, couldn't really understand and didn't, re didn't really understand or make anything of it. And so that's when we decided to take it further. And, um, and so we were left with this complete question mark as to why it was happening. And it was really affecting him badly. And um, we, we, it's not until we saw Dr. Mummery um, I think it was not the last time, the time before, in July, I can't remember, that she actually felt it could be to do with the signals in the brain not, not signaling correctly and it could cause this kind of result. And she did suggest perhaps diversion um, might make a difference. And I'll come to that later if you want to know. It did make quite a difference indeed, I've got to say, and I think she's got it spot on. Fantastic. Yes, definitely. Um, I was going to ask you about that. So the, in, in terms of the treatment for his headaches, go ahead, Jackie, fill me in. Well, uh, at first, um, it was mainly diversion. In fact, he's done a lot of gardening lately. He can sometimes be in the garden all day and he tends to forget about everything. Um, there had been some pills possibly he would take with regard to his mood because I find with this um, FTD and PPA that the mood has been affected hugely and there's the element of temper and a bad temper, not always triggered by anything irritating, but just, I don't know why. And uh, but he's decided not to take that medication. Again, no logical reason, which unfortunately with this illness, often logic doesn't um, prevail. So um, we found that I should say round about September, which is a year on from when it started, it did um, dissipate and we haven't had a lot of trouble with it um, in the last few months, but it has been a very difficult, it was a very difficult time. He hasn't complained about it at all. So thank God we're, we seem to have somehow alleviated this problem which as Dr Murray suggested was part of the condition and not anything else. That's fantastic and it's great to hear the techniques in terms of um, the distraction techniques and um, really great to hear that he's a keen gardener and upkeeping <laughs> like the garden must look beautiful. Um, I was going to ask because I know that you mentioned that there was a big question mark when you go into professionals um, surrounding the issue of his headaches. Do you feel that the overall treatment of Zion's headaches um, were different due to his dementia diagnosis? Do you think that professionals treated you different or maybe focused more on the dementia aspect rather than his pain at times? I, I don't think when we first went to someone about a year, more than a year and a quarter ago in the team, I don't think they, they actually 
took it seriously. It wasn't a headache as, um, in as much it wasn't a blinding pain, it was pressure on the head. Mm -hmm. uh, he felt a pressure and he didn't take Panadol necessarily to relieve it. And I don't think we got any conclusion there. His eyes were tested. Also his eyes have been slightly affected by the condition. We can go on to that later. And um, that is why we went to get everything checked out. And I think it's only when we saw Dr. Mummery around about July um, 2021, that's right, um, that, that it was considered that, that it was part of the condition. And I really do agree with her because no other explanation has um, been diagnosed. I think it really is. I think part of the condition does send signals from the brain, um, not correctly to where it would normally go if you didn't have this condition. So um, I don't know if it would have just um, got better on its own, <clears throat> but I felt that with doing lots of things, it just tended to, um, get better and I find in the summer it's a lot easier for us because it's easier to be outdoors and walk and and do more things in the winter it's a little bit um you know closed in and the weather's quite miserable absolutely I think that's really important factor there that in the summer a lot easier to be active a lot easier to get outdoors doing the things which Zion enjoys and in the winter you are cooped up a little bit more inside because yes. of because of that mm. Most definitely, yes, yes. So you mentioned there about the changes in his eyes, so the eye eyesight there. Can you talk a little bit more about yeah, that? Um, that's fascinating. Absolutely. Well, he's had eye tests recently at, at the petition, and that's fine. He hasn't got anything underlying, so we know that's all right. And um, he feels sometimes if he's looking at something, he doesn't really read much now, that it looks blurry. And I think, um, and sometimes if he's watching the television, it, it is blurry. I, I think this was all encompassed in the, the headache um, that he called it. We didn't know what to call it. It was a blurriness. It was a, a pres pressure on the head, an uncomfortable feeling, a feeling of being a little bit dizzy when he turned his head. And um, I think that that's all part of it. And I... The blurriness is, so he finds it hard to read. And I think it is the condition I've got to say. I don't think it's the actual vision mm -hmm. because his eyesight, apart from that, is okay. Mm -hmm. As we found out with the um, various um, opticians appointments we made. That is all the questions which I was going to ask you today. Is there anything else you'd like to add further? Well, I'd like to add, I don't know if anyone who's going to be joining the meeting has found the same. I suspect, I find one of the most difficult aspects is the, the mood and the temper. And I know this is to do with the condition where the brain cells have died. Um, and I don't really know. I have been told to, to walk away or to get off the subject. And every time I do, he says, he knows. He says, you're walking away because you don't want to talk. Or he shouts it at me or you're walking. You, he notices, which I suppose is a good sign that he's actually observing that I am noticing that. But I try and diffuse it. And the best way to diffuse it is for me to disappear. But then that annoys him even more. I don't know if there are any tips that your end has about really trying to deal with a temper tantrum that doesn't work from me disappearing or trying to change it to another subject. But he says, you're changing the subject. But I haven't worked out a tactic as to how to, to deal with it properly. Well, that's a very good question. And I think that sometimes it is due to trial and error. We know that people living with FTD, PPA, sometimes do, in, in your words, experience changes with their mood and, um, Sometimes it is about, as carers, as people caring for people living with rare dementia, choosing our battles. Yeah. Sometimes, absolutely, I can see you're nodding there, yes. Definitely, it's not worth trying to resolve everything and it, it can't always be resolved It's if it's a temper phase for something. Today has been absolutely fantastic. It's been an absolute privilege talking to you and very fascinating to hear about 
um, Zion's headaches. And I'm sure that your experiences um, of diffusing arguments um, uh, will definitely resonate with a lot of the members watching here today. Um, so thank you so much. If anybody does have any questions, then please do pop them in the questions box and we will be answering them later in today's webinar. But for now, thank you so much, Jack. Okay, and I just add, I'm glad to have helped in any other time um, you would like me to help. I'm absolutely delighted. Oh, thank you so much, Jackie. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye, Livy. Bye-bye. All the best. Yeah, so thank you so much to um, Jackie, very generously sharing her experience, lived experience there, and also to Livy for facilitating all of that. And um, this will come up in the q and I'm sure, but uh, it is a very, very complex matrix when you consider that um, people with PPA can have actually have altered sensitivity to pain, so they may have some other intercurrent condition and then, then their, their experience of that will be different. But then compounding that, they may also be unable to communicate what is happening. Uh, and so it can be doubly difficult then for, for you know, medical practitioners to, to cotton on to what's wrong. And sometimes the stress of other kinds gets channeled into an expression of physical pain and people will describe a physical symptom that actually signifies something else. So, for example, we see actually also people with Alzheimer's disease often complain of headaches. And what I think often they're complaining of is sort of... Um, muzzy headedness and, and being unable to cope with some of the sensory stimuli that they're receiving. And that's a, a kind of a shorthand. So this can be really difficult to, un, to untangle. So um, we look forward though to hearing uh, some of your comments after, you know, feedback from this meeting as well, so that we can start to learn some more about this. So I think we should probably kick on because we always tend to run over with the Q&A. Um, so um, panellists are uh, uh, kindly joining, as is Nikki, who I think most of you will know, who's the, the, the lead for, for um, RDS, and also Ali Rose. Um, and so I think we should, Anna, you're chairing, so I think I should allow you to proceed at that point. Thank you, Jason. Thank you so much, Professor Warren. And thank you for all the wonderful talks today from Ali Rose and Ida and Jackie with um, Olivia, that was absolutely fantastic. We've had heaps of questions coming in and some of them we've received prior to the meeting today. And I will be addressing, if you've got any questions, please add them to the Q&A. We've also already received lots of questions in the Q&A, including a couple of questions, for example, about, um, references somebody asked about a reference for the study and we will circulate those references with after the meeting today um, we and many of the questions have been added to the main list so if you've got any additional questions add them to the main list we will try and get through them now if we're not able to we will address them afterwards unfortunately Ida can't stay with us she's answered some of the questions in anticipation but she said she's happy to respond to any later. So let's get started. There's a question here that arrived before the meeting today. And um, Professor Warren, I think this one is for you, actually. Um, so the first question, it's about oxygen therapy, which is a question we occasionally get, isn't it, in clinic? And this person has asked whether HBOT or oxygen therapy might be useful for slowing down the progression of primary progressive aphasia. Yeah, so, so yes, we do, do have interest in this. So this is hyperbaric oxygen, um, and that, that's the, um, the same sort of treatment that you might hear about the sort of conventional use for it originally was, was for treatment of divers with the bends who, who were kind of um, often seriously ill, um, who didn't decompress properly. But it's become kind of extended into other areas, people with carbon monoxide poisoning and other things clinically. But very specific indications, unfortunately, because you know the idea of promoting oxygen flow to, to tissues that might be ailing um, sick neurons, sick brain cells is a really it's a good idea. But there's in principle, but there's no evidence that I'm aware of uh, that that really strongly supports its use in in dementia and and in particular in PPA. So I think it's a kind of an interesting thought, but we lack, as with many of these things, we lack evidence. Thank you. Um, and speaking of evidence, 
Um, somebody has asked a little bit about pain, Ali Rose, and they've asked a bit about the evidence around the pain that people with semantic variant PPA or semantic dementia can experience. This person has said they've read that people with semantic dementia can experience pain more acutely than somebody without this condition. And they wondered, is it known why that this, this is the case and what is happening to the person with semantic dementia to make them feel pain more acutely? I think actually Jason addressed this, uh, Professor Warren addressed this somewhat when he was explaining about the interpret the way we interpret pain, um, so and actually that some people with semantic dementia may find it very difficult to make sense of their experiences. Is that fair, Ali Rose? And then should we start with Ali Rose and then move to Professor Warren? Yeah, I would absolutely agree. Um, and again, it's a lot to do. And I think Professor Warren might be best to describe it in terms of the neurology behind it. But um, it has a lot to do with, I suppose, the degeneration and, and how it, it affects the, the frontal and temporal lobes of the brain and, and how we process pain, how we understand it, how we relay and communicate that we are in pain. Um, and again, our interpretation and our own personal thresholds. So there, I think it's, it's multifaceted and Jason may be able to add in the neurology side of that. Um, but what I think is, is quite interesting is that, um, yeah, you know, there again, pain is it's interpreted. It's all about how we, we feel about it, how we experience it. And I think that the real issue around this is how we can understand if someone is experiencing pain and even that physical pain a lot of the time can present um, as we'll say behavioral disturbance. And we may feel that someone is, you know, um, you know, acting out or just not themselves. So I suppose it's about um, not just looking for the physical signs, but looking very much at the, the total pain, the whole psychological, spiritual, um, social side of someone in assessment. Is, does Jason want to add? Yeah, I think, think that the thing to remember about pain is we can't measure it in the same way that we can measure strength, for example. It, it, it's impossible to do that, even in principle. So, um, I mean, somatic dementia, we, if people are interested, it has been a research focus. The, the pain perception of people with somatic dementia has been a research focus of ours. It's, it's now beginning to be taken up much more widely. It, it, um, there's a lot of interest, for example, in the big genetic FTD cohort. Some of you will know about um, GenFi that Jonathan Rohrer runs, have begun to look at this, and several of the big US groups have started to take it up, and the Sydney group I mentioned. Um, but we have really looked into this and looked into what the brain areas are that are involved. And so somatic dementia, it's complex. Um, but in general, and there will always be, you know, maybe even people on this call say, well, that's not my experience. So there are always ex exceptions. But as a group, people with somatic dementia tend to have heightened sensitivity, mm -hmm. which interestingly contrasts with people with frontal, frontal temporal dementias that tend as a group to have reduced sensitivity to, pa to pain. And this is probably a combination of things. So it's probably how it's conceptualized because people's understanding of signals is of course is abnormal in somatic dementia, but also genuinely the way those signals are being sort of trafficked in the brain. So the disease as some of you, certainly those living with somatic dementia will know is a disease of the temporal lobes of the brain. So the left temporal lobe, which is usually where it starts is, is kind of very much the conceptual center where we kind of think about what does this mean in terms of ways we can verbalize and talk to other people about. The right temporal lobe is the sort of non-verbal analog of that. And actually people who have either early problems with the right temporal lobe or as it starts to be involved, as it always is eventually with somatic dementia, um, often have very kind of ill-defined somatic, as we call them, sort of bodily sensations, aches and pains, things they can't properly pin down and really, really difficult. Often go to the GP, um, without success, you know, really bothered by this. And, and this area of the brain seems to be, where our work suggests, seems to be an area where the kind of the brain values, puts a value on incoming sensory information. And, I, and it doesn't just mean likes it, it can mean doesn't like it. So it can be a positive or a negative value. Um, even without even thinking about whether or not we can conceptualize it. It's just this very basic, you know, do I actually want more of this or I, do I definitely want to avoid this at all costs? And, and the kind of autonomic or the kind of um, automatic um, incoming signals 
the area of the brain, and this might come up again in other forms of PPA, um, that starts to get involved in somatic dementia, the insula, which is also involved in other forms of PPA, mm. is like the kind of ground centre for pain perception, sensory perception, and where the brain really receives all these signals and starts to kind of parcel them out. So there's many reasons why, and, and it can be a major problem, and it can also be an issue which either leads to futile visits, so to GPs and medical practitioners where no cause is found, or the opposite, it can actually be something which gets dismissed. And, of course, often it then turns out there is some problem. So it needs constant vigilance is what I would say. And, unfortunately, it can be quite difficult to treat because, you know, yeah. conventional analgesics and things like that, of course, are not really the answer for something like this. Um, which are, they're, they're usually acting right on the outer sort of parts of this whole system. So can um, antidepressants help, somebody's asked? If yeah, so, so, so people get complex changes in their mood as well, yeah. and sometimes actually depression um, or reacting to what's happening to them. And antidepressants, even without depression, actually can have a role because we talk about the neurologists when they don't understand something, say it modulates. Yeah. The, yeah. the signal, which means it somehow changes, it interferes with the brain's processing of that signal. So um, if, for example, there's too much awareness of sensations, mm -hmm. some of these antidepressant tablets, the newer ones particularly, um, can actually help to kind of regularise that. So we sometimes do use it for other forms of behaviour as well, actually, but it can they can have a role, even in people who aren't obviously depressed. Yeah. That's really helpful. Thank you, Professor Warren. So in other words... It, it, people can experience pain who people may experience pain and either over interpret or under interpret these this experience in some way and one of the treatments we can use is antidepressants somebody else has asked about counseling actually and I wondered if this was something for Nikki so it, it was much broader, this question. Someone's asked if there are any counselling services for people with PPA, not suffering from pain, but who are suffering from depression. Well, we're, we're really looking into this at the moment. So we've started sort of within the clinic, um, the psychological services, which Dr. Emma Hard is doing. So she is, um, and um, Ish as well, one of the colleagues as well, they're doing some psychological therapies, so talking therapies for people. And they've got a great understanding of the rarer types of dementia, especially PPA. So this is this is something that's becoming really sort of quite popular for them. Now we're very um, mindful that we have got a limited service here. So we are reaching out to the general services, to the IAPS and the other talking therapy services, which people will find much more locally. So we can join forces with them to put a bit of our expert rare dementia experience and uh, professionalism and knowledge within those services which will help a much further range of people so if people do want to get in contact if they are feeling that they this is a an extra bit of support that they want we can help sort of navigate that pathway for them well that's really super thank you nikki um that that's really helpful for us to think about i know that there are lots of there's lots more research in this field as well that's being developed there was there's a paper coming another paper when professor warren mentioned about the sydney group um i know there's a speech and language therapist who works with that group who's written um a paper on ppa and um how speech and language therapy and some counseling services can actually overlap um which is a really interesting paper and i and i know that emma harding are um, who's doing that work that Nikki mentioned and I in our clinical work we're collaborating on a number of projects and with working with a number of people together. Now there's another question here there's two questions actually which which are linked so um, and one of them is for Ida and Ida, Ida's given me a bit of an answer in and I will um, read out what she's already said and then there's the second question links with this but is actually probably more for Ali Rose so it's about people being able to tell us how they feel. So um, there's a question here for Ida. And the question is, what do you do if the person with PPA cannot articulate if they enjoy an activity? Is it better to encourage them to continue it or not? Now, Ida has um, 
flag that if you observe somebody's behavior, it can tell us lots of information. And Ida and I are singing from the same hymn sheet here because I often talk about nonverbal communication with people. I think we focus, we get focused so much on what people are saying verbally, yes, I'm enjoying it, or no, I'm not, that sometimes we forget to look at what they're doing to see if they're enjoying it. So we can look at their body language, look at their facial expression, their smiling, um, whether they're smiling or not, whether they're actually concentrating or attending to something or not, whether the person is actually um, doing more of it or withdrawing from the activity. So if perhaps if they're withdrawing from it, that might suggest that it's not something they want to continue. If that person's mood seems to lift during the activity, that would suggest perhaps that they're enjoying it. If somebody's mood seems to dip, then that might suggest they're not. Um, as a rule of thumb, Ida emphasizes, encourage action until you get an actual sign of whether the person is enjoying it or not. It's the only way for you to figure it out. So that was Ida's ending words. I'm going to move to that question for Ali Rose, because again, somebody has asked, how do we know if a person is unable to articulate whether they're experiencing pain? And I'll read the question specifically. So this is a person who says, my wife with PPA is unable to speak beyond very occasional, occasional and unreliable yes or no's, but she can groan, especially at night. Do you have any ideas on whether other cues one would normally get apart from speech might indicate pain and can be relied upon to indicate if she might be in pain? For example, if she does not show pain on her face or hold a part of her body, if she's not doing that, what else can we do? Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Anna. Um, and would absolutely agree with Ida just before I start in terms of, you know, encouraging someone until it's it's very clear that absolutely, no, I really don't have an interest in, in doing this today, but, um, you know, we'll always try and encourage um, nonetheless. In terms of observing if someone is enjoying or if someone enjoying something or perhaps someone is in pain, it is just so, so difficult. Um, you know, we won't say otherwise. It is very, very difficult with the frontotemporal dementias and can be very difficult with PPA. Um, just again, from speaking with carers and family carers, it's just an area that I think um, people worry so much about and it's completely valid um, because we want to ensure that our person um, with PPA is, is not in pain. That's the least we want to do. Um, so I suppose what I always emphasize to people and in clinical and, and, and through the cohort study is that you as a carer, you are the expert and you know the person better than absolutely anyone else, no matter how many years in college or how many experience in this setting or that, um, you are an expert in them and you are their expert. So just have confidence in yourself that you know them. And if you feel something is off, then it probably is off. So, um, you know, do, to have confidence in going forward and following up with your GP or whoever the go-to person is um, and exploring that a bit more. So if you feel someone's not right and you feel they're in pain, they may very well be. Um, visual cues are always the first port of call for, for anyone, I suppose. We're looking at the person head to toe and seeing, you know, are they are they are their peripheries very cold? Are their hands very cold? Um, are you know, are they looking agitated? Are they shuffling a lot in their seat? Um, are they grimacing? So they're kind of classical telltale signs, again, differ from every single individual. Um, but I suppose in, in kind of later stages of dementia, it can be really, really difficult to even tell that. Um, and that's where your assessment, even things like for us, we'll have a look at the blood pressure, the temperature, the observations. Um, is that practical for everyone to be checking everyone's observation every hour of the day at home? Absolutely not. Um, but a lot of the time people are prescribed baseline um, pain relief, um, such as even paracetamol or uh, pain relief that can be accessed when needed. So if you do feel someone is off and this is commonly prescribed across all chronic illness and less prescribed in the area of dementia care. So again, we've highlighted that we are working towards it and it's something that you can most definitely flag um, with your GP. And I just feel having that kind of uh, bank of, of um, you know, a pain relief just in case um, is a great reassurance to, to carers and to people with PPA. You might never need it, but we always say best to be looking at it than for it. Um, so I hope, I hope that makes some sense. <laughs> That's a really nice way of putting it. Best to be looking at it rather than for it. Best to have that tool in your toolbox rather than be searching for it. 
Um, there's a, there is another question around pain that I think links in with what you're saying, Ali Rose. It's actually a question that's been addressed to both Ida and yourself, and Ida has flagged that she's going to write an email. Um, but I wondered if maybe Ali Rose, you could start and probably Professor Rowan can add to this. Um, the question is, is there, can there be physical pain, can physical pain be blunted as well as emotional experiences. So um, in Ida's talk, she talked about reference, basically emotional blunting in, in the words of this person. Can, can that happen with pain as well? Maybe Ali Rose, I can see Ali Rose and Professor Rod Warren nodding. <laughs> Do you want to go first, Professor Warren? No, I think Ali Rose should go first. Super. <laughs> um, so I'm going, I'm going to throw back at Professor Warren. I think he might be best to answer it. But um, what I do think, just from my own experience, again, Professor Warren can add, I can add on this, but um, I do feel that there, there can be blunting in that there may be a lack of, of realisation um, of, I suppose, of particular symptoms or behavioural expressions um, just at the, the early stages of the, the, frontal temporal, the frontal temporal dementias and PPA. Um, so... I'm not 100% sure to, to give you a solid answer on that. I do feel clinically that, that there may, may very well be. Um, Jason, you might be best to answer this if that's okay. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Anyway, I mean, it, it is, um, it is compl complicated. The answer is yeah. The short answer is yes, it can be. I, I, I was going to say, though, with respect to that last uh, comment as well, it, it, some of the signals, it, it is so difficult because some of the signals that we would, you know, normally take as evidence of pain, so, for example, repetitive groaning and so on, uh, may not be in PPA. So I've certainly seen people as the disease goes along who make a lot of noises, sometimes even shouting or screaming, where there, it doesn't seem to be linked to, to anything and uh, physical and, in fact, all other forms of distress. And so, you know, you are, do have to kind of look at other cues, like, you know, if someone's making these noises but obviously is engaging, going about their business, isn't showing any other signs, colour, crying, any other signs of distress, you know, it may not be. Um, the other thing is sometimes you do just have to take them to the GP because the GP, hopefully, um, in this, even nowadays, will be able to do things like fill their tummy and so on, which is sort of, uh, you know, just looking to see things, being a bit preemptive. And the offering paracetamol and things of that kind is also important. You know, simple analgesics is, is also important. But the blunting of pain is a reality. I mean, the most striking examples I think I've seen cl clinically have been people with, with frontal temporal behavioural variant. Uh, one lady I vividly remember who was sitting in, sitting in clinic with, with a swollen jaw. He had a massive tooth abscess, which must have been incredibly painful and had no obvious distress from it, no overt distress, completely nonchalant. Um, and you could ask, well, how could that happen? But, you know, we, we see this... Uh, doctors have used this medically over the years where, where the, the, you know, the signals are coming in from the pain structures, so in the mouth or in, in, the, in the limbs, but they have, they get rooted through some other brain structures. So they go through the thalamus, for example, which is this kind of big relay centre, um, grey matter um, nucleus that sits below the cortex of the brain. And doctors have damaged, deliberately damaged the thalamus in some cases to try and, um, you know, people have intractable pain, you know, for other reasons that can't be treated. And it removes the, the kind of distress. So the person might still say to you, yeah, I have, you know, if they, if they uh, so I mean, someone other than someone with PPA might say, oh, yeah, I've got 10 out of 10 pain, but there's no signs of, you know, arousal physiologically, there's no signs of distress. So it's as if it's disconnected. So something like this might actually happen in um, diseases that we see, the degenerative diseases. And of course, um, some of PPA, so for example, you know, sometimes in semantic, but also particularly in the non-fluent variety, um, these other subcortical structures like the thalamus, deep structures in the brain do get involved with the disease. And so, you know, it would be, I think, quite likely that there must be people who have blunting for that reason. And clinically, it can be very difficult to assess, but I think there are people who just seem to, you know, we, we probably, I'd say, we probably see it more often, not so much with pain, but with temperature. So you'll get people coming to clinic who are just completely inappropriately dressed, you know, freezing cold weather, and they're kind of coming along 
wearing a t-shirt or it's the opposite you know and they don't seem to be at all bothered by this and so i think i think it's kind of a signal that there is some major disorder in the way the brain is processing sensory information in, in either direction really yeah you've answered another question professor Oren, about somebody asked about um temperature and i was going to yeah. add we, we often see people come in in puffer jackets, huge jackets, coats in the middle of the summer. And, um, and they, and I might say, ask them if, if they feel warm and they say, yes, I, I acknowledge it's hot, but I'm fine. And um, so the, which is essentially as professor Warren described this idea of being able to recognize something, but not experiencing, uh, the, any physiological kind of, uh, reaction to that. Um, but the 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 question perhaps is a slightly more specific question, and the question asked: It could we consider sensitivity to ambient temperature as pain? It's it's the same. It's very closely related. The same pathways uh, coming in from the periphery, from the from the sense mm. organs out in the skin. They're very closely allied. Um, in the brain, things start to get shuffled about a bit um so they're not they're not identical of course but they're but right along the line actually they're quite closely related and actually when we studied this we, we our paper that we published on this is pain and temperature so so they don't you might say well does that mean they change in the same direction that unfortunately is not the case so you do get people who can be complaining bitterly of pain and also apparently insensitive to temperature and vice versa so it's you know, it's, 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 it's not some simple relationship, but the, they're, they're quite closely related in the brain. So I'd, I'd say changes in one often have changes in the other, but they may not be in the same uh, direction. Mm. Thank you, Professor Warren. Now I've got two questions here, slightly more related to speech and language therapy. So I'm going to answer these, but I might answer them in collaboration with Nikki, because these are questions we often get I think Nikki, you often receive um, on on the telephone when people ring um, the rare, Dem rare dementia support team. And the first question is that the, the person says, "My local NHS speech and language therapy team do not see patients unless they have swallowing difficulties. How can I access speech and language therapy for communication in my area?" Is it fair to say, Nikki, that's a question you often get? It is. It's very, very common. And, and actually, in some of the clinics that I've worked in London, I know that some of the boroughs in London only commission for swallowing problems and not speech and language therapy. Yes, it's a big problem. And, and we've even done some research a little while ago. We did a UK wide survey. I did that as part of my research. Oh, I think it, 2017 and it's still relevant um, now, but I looked across the UK and I found that there's a huge inequity in speech and language therapy for vision where some services are able to provide heaps of therapy for communication and some services cannot provide any. Um, so when that happens, I so first of all, I think Nikki, in, if, if someone's just looking for speech therapy, we try and recommend they go to their GP first of all, because some services do provide local therapy and not just for swallowing and more and more services are able to provide therapy for communication where <laughs> excuse me where people's uh, uh, recruitment not recruitment their service criteria are changing and um, but where they are not able to um, we are some so Nick, Nikki might often ask me to talk to somebody um, on the telephone as a one-off um, and I can give advice or I can often point people in the right direction, <clears throat> how to seek um, access to speech and speech language therapy. Otherwise, in some situations, I'm able to support the person in my clinical role through the national hospital. Um, but for some people that doesn't work because we're based down in London. So we try and problem solve that together. The second question is, I think another question we get a lot of um, through the support team, Nikki, it's about saliva management. Um, so somebody's asked their, their mother who's been diagnosed with PPA only a few months ago is complaining of having too much saliva in her mouth. The doctors have prescribed her with atropine drops. I'm pleased they have, 
because many doctors don't do that. So atropine drops, for anybody who doesn't know, they're drops you can pop on your tongue and they reduce the amount of saliva. Um, and they're, they're quite easy to use. Um, but it has also caused oral thrush. And again, oral thrush is very common. So oral thrush, thrush is, uh, looks like a buildup of white um, on the tongue and it can be quite uncomfortable for people on their tongue. It can um, reduce the sensory feedback. So people find that they can't um, feel as much on their tongue. It can impact on swallowing, um, but it's also easily managed. Um, and the speech and language therapist here has suggested that, she, he, that this person's mother may be hypersensitive to her saliva rather than there being an excess. Now, the question is, is hypersensitivity to saliva a symptom of PPA? This is causing the most anguish currently. And partly because of this, this person spends 90% of her time in bed. As it says, being, as she says, being in bed alleviates the discomfort. Is there anything more I can do to help her with this issue? Now, interestingly, I would say that um, in the work I do clinically with Professor Warren, I'd say over the last couple of years I've had at least three or four people um all who have had semantic variant actually um who've reported finding they have an excess of saliva or saliva dripping down the back of their tongue or a post nasal drip people often describe it as um or feeling like there's a lump in their throat um and this this has been unrelated to a swallowing difficulty. So people may often find that they feel they've got excess saliva associated with a swallowing difficulty. So for some people, um, ordinarily we get rid of our saliva, we all have lots of saliva and we reflexively clear it regularly. And for some people, if you have a swallowing difficulty, you don't clear that saliva and it feels like you have more, but you don't, you're just not getting rid of it. Um, but for these other people, for a small number of people, I'm starting to formulate um, a theory that, that we may, people may be experience a, a different, experiencing a different sensory um, reaction it to, to the saliva being in their mouth. And Professor Warren, I, I can see in our future perhaps a bit of a paper on this, <laughs> um, because I think it's something that people are asking us more and more about. So. Professor Owen, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, I have to say I think that's a new observation, but it's a very interesting, plausible one. And and I, what I would say, right, we we have seen, I've been aware of, but I will certainly pay more attention to the saliva issue. Is just the general um, heightened, sometimes unhelpfully heightened sensitivity to one's own body, mm. and and, and th this can be a big problem. So people occasionally can become really convinced that some part of their body is wrong or it's, they don't like it and it's not you know it doesn't seem to have changed or to be any so I, I think that this is part of that probably it can become a focus of obsession um, it is interesting I think saliva it was just thinking as you were talking I mean it's one of the you know it's obviously quite laden as a bodily fluid of course it's quite laden with lots of other people don't like it very much often it's you know we're taught from an early age you know, spitting is you know very antisocial for example um and i think it's something that people are aware of is inside their body and it, and it kind of is in their mouth which is another dimension so I, I can see how it could well become a focus of this if there is this tendency going on but there might be more broadly you know other changes in bodily awareness I mean, the only, and I, this is, I'm really just making this up on the spot, but the only thing I would think about maybe is obviously you look for local reasons and look at swallowing as Anna's suggesting first, but if it really is refractory that this might be the, you know, the antidepressant sort of to try and reduce the obsession or worry about it. Um, the problem with just switching it all off, you know, because there, there are people with some diseases in the sort of Parkinson's type diseases yeah. get massive amounts of saliva, uh, which, which are easily measurable. We can see that they, they have this sialuria, it's called the medical term for this. And sometimes they get can get, get their saliva glands switched off with Botox injections and this sort of thing. So we've got a specialist clinic that does this. Um, I think the problem with doing that is if you don't actually have masses of saliva is that you run the risk of all the things to do with dry mouth, like 
carries and uh, slash and you know other things. So I think it would be you know we need to walk a line with it but I mean no one wants of course someone to be in a very distressed state and becoming a focus of obsession so I think there'd be a couple of things maybe to try mm. but I but it, it it's yeah it's an interesting observation Anna and I'd be interested very interested we would be interested to know if this is actually going on much more widely that we don't know about it's, there's just been another question asking how wide this is so somebody's asked do many PPA members experience excess mucage or blockage at the back of the nose or sinus and I think for some people they will describe that as a post-nasal um drip so um just, just to say post-nasal drip is very common it, it is and, and, yeah. and you know you know about this Anna, but but you know ENT speech and language therapy and ENT oh, are, are really good ports of call to check yeah. people out because you don't want to assume this is some complex central processing disorder no. when actually it's it's to do with some problem you could easily treat yeah indeed and I was just about to say the same so I always recommend people also seek advice from ear, nose and throat who can actually have a look um, and check, but it is incredibly common. Um, we, we, it, it's especially I've found having worked um, as a speech and language therapist, um, the, the older we get, the, the more common that seems to be. Um, so there's a couple more questions. There's a question here. Can we say something that somebody would like us to say something about the behavioral aspects of logopenic variant PPA that are caused by ours, as in the type of PPA associated with Alzheimer's um, disease. My wife has executive function deficits and has had that since early on. And this person says, we are now seeing more neuropsychiatric symptoms, including shouting outbursts and verbal and behavioral disinhibition in public, public. Is this typical or atypical with this disease? Now, Haida hasn't had a, an opportunity to give us any information on this. I anticipate that she will um, want to provide an answer via email to this question. But I wonder if there's anyone on the panel who'd like to provide an answer. Yeah, so at the risk of, of, of talking too much, yes. Um, so I, I think this is a big issue, actually, for some people with logopenic aphasia, and it's it is almost completely unrecognised. And... Um, we're, got, we're trying to put it on record. It's, it, I mean, as a complex behavioural change, it's difficult, actually, because it's not, you know, it isn't, I'm not suggesting language is easy, Anna, but you can't measure behaviours even as easy as you can measure naming, for example, and other things. But I have seen people with logopenic aphasia in whom this is the biggest problem. And I, and I think the problem, one of the issues is, I think logopenic aphasia itself can be quite variable, even within the Alzheimer's spectrum, and, it's, and it, you know, I don't understand why the variation is there, but I do see it. So maybe it's age, younger people often seem to have this. It can be a very aggressive illness in some people, unfortunately. Um, people can have seizures and other things with it. And actually behavioural changes can be severe. Um, it's a spectrum, but a lot of people with Alzheimer's of any kind will become um, often more irritable, just in a kind of not very unpleasant way, but just a bit, more snappy and irritable, they can often become more dependent and clingy to their primary loved one. Um, less initiative, just a bit more sort of a bit more childlike. Um, some people say they've they got, they've become sort of mollified or milder with with it um, in a way they may have been quite abrasive person that 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 gets blunted as well. But actually, on top of that, we do also see changes where people can become very agitated sometimes with delusions, sometimes very frightening beliefs and uh, maybe even hallucinations even, I have seen in one person I'm thinking of, um, where this seemed to be part of the illness with logopenic aphasia. And, and so I think it needs vigilance and it, may, and it needs treatment. And actually we, the usual way we manage logopenic aphasia, as, as those of you living with it may know, is a trial of the Alzheimer medications. And sometimes that is effective actually, so denepazil and rivastigmine and these medications, they can be quite effective sometimes in getting on top of some of these changes, but sometimes antidepressants and others are necessary. And, and occasionally referral to a psychiatry or neuropsychiatry if available, and even antipsychotic medications sometimes can be necessary. And there, then you need to be really careful. As most of you on the call will know, we have some cautions about the use of these medicines, but sometimes they are necessary. That's one end of the spectrum. 
But I do think it's, yes, it's real. It probably is the disease itself, but we don't understand it well and we're, we're still learning about it and why it's much more severe in some people than others. Because I'm sure there, I'd be absolutely confident there are people on this call who are saying, what are they talking about? You know, it's, they're, they're, they're fine, they're lovely. But it does happen to some people. Mm. And just to add to that repertoire of tools, I often find that in, in Ali Rose's words it's good to have it all there rather than be looking for it and I, I think sometimes as the speech and language therapist we might add to that repertoire of pharmacological interventions with a couple of behavioral strategies and um, which can just add to that repertoire so things like distracting the person moving them onto another task um, walking away from the person if that is happening um, uh, changing the environment, for example, putting on some music that can, it really depends on the individual. And we try and look at what's happening for that individual for the behavioral strategies, but we would certainly recommend coming to speak to us. So calling up Nikki or speaking to Professor Warren or myself, anyone on the team, if you're looking for some advice and where to go next. Now I'm mindful of time. We've actually got through all of the questions, except the ones for Ida, which is unusual. And um, we will make sure that the questions for Ida, she, who, she's already volunteered to write some emails for a number of questions. So if your question hasn't been asked, she will be writing an, an answer. Um, we've also been asked for, I mentioned earlier, for some references for um, Ida's talk. And then finally about some Somebody's asked for the details of the um, Sydney group that I mentioned, and I can do that. And, um, and also about the counselling and speech and language therapy. I'm very happy to provide that link. I will hand back over to Professor Warren. And um, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Anna. And, and we, we're going to a close. Um, I hope that that's been useful for everyone. And I thank all the panelists um, and all our speakers, really great, some great talks and some great insights. Um, and Anna for chairing that session. Um, can I ask you please to, 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 to stay, there's a very brief message from our sponsor coming up, um, the National Brain Appeal, um, who fund a lot of our work and have made a very big contribution, particularly to their dementia support over, over the years and are very integral to our work. So if you would please stay on, that would be really, really kind. And um, I will say goodbye and look forward to hopefully meeting you all and some of you in the interim but also catching up with you at the next meeting we'll send details on in due course so goodbye for now hello my name is eva tate and i'm the major appeals manager and manager of the rare dementia support fund held by the charity the national brain appeal the National Brain Appeal raises money as the dedicated charity for the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and UCL Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. The National Brain Appeal raises funds for Rare Dementia Support's 2,000 members to help individuals living with rare and early onset forms of dementia, their families, friends and healthcare professionals. And we also hold several other funds for FTD and dementia research. The funding helps not only the support group meetings in London, but also the regional support groups, admin and support staff and all other associated expenses, including the new online support groups. When, when things return to normal, there are travel and accommodation bursaries available to help members attend the meetings. This year, we've raised our fundraising target to 300,000, and this will rise further to 350,000 by 2022 to develop and extend the service in the areas of education, support and research, with the ultimate aim that everyone affected by a form of rare dementia will have access to specialist information and support, as well as contact with other people with a similar condition. We apply for grants from grant making trusts, foundations and livery companies and have a wonderful group of supporters, some of whom are here today, who fundraise for us in an amazing variety of ways. We would love it if you would like to sign up to our RDS fundraising newsletter to hear more of these stories and receive news of how we can support this community. We have had people do head shaves for us. We have had um, a gentleman drive across the Mongolian steppe in a VW polo and we have lots of people who take part in runs and virtual runs as well. At the end of February, we held a gala dinner called Mission Possible, where we raised 110,000 for the expansion of Red Dementia support. And we are delighted to announce that in line with this expansion, 
the charity is committed to raise up to seven million to create the world's first centre of excellence for rare dementias. If anyone would like to discuss any fundraising ideas or the new capital appeal, um, please do feel free to email me or my colleague Alexis, our senior fundraising manager, who will speak about the innovative new ways you can be involved in fundraising for RDS, even during this challenging time. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Alexis Gebby and I'm the senior fundraising officer at the National Brain Appeal. Um, I just want to start off by saying a huge thank you to all of you who already fundraise for RDS. We really appreciate all of your incredible efforts, especially at this difficult time. My role at the National Brain Appeal is to look after all the amazing people taking on various fundraising activities for us. We have had people challenging themselves to run marathons, cycle long distances, climb mountains and even take on skydives, all whilst raising money for RDS. We also have wonderful fundraisers out in the community who organise golf days, hold coffee mornings, host choir and carol concerts and even shave their heads. These people ensure that more people like you can be supported through Rare Dementia support. If you're interested in becoming one of our fundraising heroes, then please do contact me. I am here to support you with your fundraising and I'm more than happy to chat about any ideas that you may have. While at the moment it isn't possible to take part in a sporting challenge or hold a big fundraising gathering in your local community, we do have some fundraising ideas, such as taking on a solo virtual run or walk, hosting a quiz for your friends or family online, asking for birthday donations in lieu of going out, or even donating money that you may be saving by not travelling to work or buying your daily coffee. Do get in touch with me if you would like to get involved. In the meantime, take care and we hope to see you soon.